And if you can master this, you can master life. And that's forgiveness. You know, life is all about this. Receiving forgiveness and giving it. And if you can master that, receiving forgiveness and giving it, you'll master life. What happens to most people is that they get hurt, they get offended, they get abused, and it's part of life. I'm not saying you should expect it, accept it, but you have to know in this life, there will be people that hurt you. And the truth is you're going to hurt people too. And this is what we need to do. Say, Jesus, forgive me. And they, or maybe you ask them, like, will you forgive me? Life is all about receiving forgiveness. And then when you receive forgiveness, you know what the next thing you do? Forgive people. And you're going to be great. You know, the Bible talks about those that are in Christ, they're believers. For them, there's no condemnation. There's no judgment. There's no guilt trips because they're forgiven. And, and when, when you receive forgiveness, you also need to learn how to forgive yourself. You know, when you start beating yourself up for the wrong things you've done, this is what happens. You start, little by little, sabotaging your own success. You start doing good, and then you just, by yourself, you do a little good, and then you start messing it all up. And I'll tell you why you do that. Because you don't feel you deserve to succeed. And it's, it's, your, it's in your subconscious. You haven't received forgiveness. Today's your day. And I pray you do receive forgiveness. You forgive yourself and then forgive everybody else so you can enjoy the rest of your life. How many believe that if you can master these two skills, it's what life is all about. There's a lot of great things happening in our church. And we have the women's, women's advance. Every woman here, um, you're, you're t this is where you should be. Um, on the, the, it says the 19th and the 20th. You should be at a women's conference. This is your day. Don't talk yourself out of being where you should be. There's going to be an impartation for purpose in your life. And if you're there, you get it. If you're, there, if you're not there, you miss it. Don't talk yourself out of missing a God appointment. Okay? Be there. Sign up. Be there. Every woman in this church should be there. This is what happens. Every year, people want to, after all the tickets are sold, oh, I want to be there. And then, you know, somebody's scalping out their tickets for 1800 bucks. No, I just kidding. Some people are scared. Right now, I'm going to buy four or five. I'm going to be scalping. Um, but also, there's another thing happening. This Friday, say, say with me, this Friday. This Friday, one of our members of our church is going to premiere their movie. It's a, it's, it's a movie that's going to be in the theaters. It's going to be released June 9th. But we're going to be the only preview in the whole world right here at the Way Royal Outreach. Now, the pro there is a problem. And the problem is we only have 300 tickets. Because Disney would not allow us to pack out. Because this is what I was going to do. I was going to invite everybody. I'm inviting everybody. But this idea, this idea, how do we determine how to get a ticket? Go to the booth and buy yourself a lead night ticket for lead night. And you'll get a ticket for this Friday. You do not want to miss it. It'll be like a red carpet event. Disney is going to be here for the first time in a church doing a premiere. They've never done it. They're going to be here. Their executives are going to be here. Um, Richard Montanez and his wife are going to be here. You're going to be able to take some pictures. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be here Friday. Get your ticket. If you get your ticket, if you get your lead night ticket, you'll get this just automatically. And I'll tell you, lead night's going to be amazing. This is what God is doing. He's exposing ourselves to great leaders so you could become a great leader. And this, this is what leaders do. They're able to get vision, get a vision, and bring it into reality. And until you become a great leader, you'll just be a dreamer. You'll be dreaming for a better life, but you'll never be able to accomplish it. You'll die with your dream. You're not supposed to die with your dream. You're supposed to accomplish your dream. And when you're done, you say, I already did it. But you're going to have to learn how to develop that kind of mindset. And the only way you develop that kind of mindset is start hanging around some leaders. So we're going to have some top people. You know, Richard Montan has invented Hot Cheetos. And it's, a, it's a, every year a billion-dollar product, product. Imagine God giving you a download of invention. Some of you guys right now are creative, but you have a blockage. And God's going to unlock your blockage. And you're going to get some divine ideas. Some of, there's some business people that are going to be unlocked. Come on. All you need is one good idea. It changes your life. How many would like to be in a place where you're like being unlocked? Also, we have Devon Franklin. He's coming and 
he's a movie producer and in in Hollywood and he's producing basically Christian movies God has chosen him to tell the stories of believers he's gonna be here this Friday no not that's Friday I'm almost messed up there he'll be here May 21st it's gonna be a Sunday night I really want you to be there okay we love you guys it's gonna be great sign up get your ticket Friday be here it's gonna be great so really lead night is gonna begin this Friday and it's a great movie they they actually did only one event in Texas at the film festival and this movie was the top movie won all the awards Disney found out about it and this is what they said we're releasing it on all of our platforms the only movie they've ever released on all their platforms and it's, it's gonna be debuted here that's this Friday right here in this theater so get your ticket all right all right we're gonna pray and then we're gonna study some um, just deep stuff I mean I don't like really right now there's so many not too many churches talking about the end times and what's going to happen in the future and I'm going to give you the best picture I can I'm basically going to go through the whole book of revelations in this short period of time it's going to be a miracle if I do it I need your help let's pray father I'm asking you Lord to teach us we want to learn and unlock these truths these prophetic truths that describe a future that's soon to come that we'll understand it, that there'll be a deep conviction and cause us to respond properly. That we'll have a mindset that's not just focused on this world, but we'll have an eternal mindset. We'll do great in this world, but we'll be prepared for their eternal life, the one that lasts forever. So speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. I just, I'm a rapper. I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. <laughs> All right. The Great Tribulation. I'm going to begin to unravel this subject. So what is the Great Tribulation? It's a seven-year period of time immediately following the rapture of the church where God begins to pour out his wrath on the world for its sins. During the Great, tri during the great Tribulation, evil will spread without restraint. The world will see the worst diseases, national disasters, and wars that have ever happened. So in this period of time, it's going to be worse than anything we've ever experienced. Now, we're beginning to see a taste of some of the things that are going to happen in the Great Tribulation, but the Bible describe it, describes it as birth pains. All it means, when a woman goes into labor, their contractions start, and then they continue, and then they become more frequent, and then they become more intense. So what we're gonna talk about today is some of the terrible things that are gonna happen in the tr Great Tribulation. Some of them are beginning now, but at the level they're gonna get to is gonna be far worse than anything we've ever seen. The seven-year tribulation is described as the worst time of suffering the earth and mankind has ever seen. In Matthew 24, 21, this will, this will be the worst time of suffering since the beginning of the world. And nothing, and nothing this terrible will ever happen again. So in this time, it's going to be the worst time of suffering and anguish on this earth. And nothing after the tribulation will ever be that bad ever again. The anguish and the pain and suffering will be so unbearable that people will try to kill themselves but won't die. It's not a place that anyone would want to be. In Revelation 9, 6, it says, In those days, men will try to kill themselves, but won't be able to. Death will not come. They will long to die, but death will flee away. Anguish, excruciating, unbearable, acute distress, suffering, pain, hopelessness, depression, fear, darkness with no relief. The world will begin to look more and more like hell on earth. They're going to want to die. They won't. Just think about somebody trying to commit suicide and they actually go through it, but yet they just have the wound, they have the pain, but they don't die. Now, who will go through the seven-year tribulation? We're talking about the future prophetically. It's been spoken, and this is a revelation that comes from Jesus Christ himself. There'll be actually people living in this time period. But who's going to be living in this time period? If you get left behind, 
you'll remember this sermon and you'll know exactly what's coming next because it's already been written. It's going to happen. And, and this is the answer. Who will go through the seven-year tribulation? Answer, very simple. Everyone that was left behind after the rapture of the church. So the next thing we covered this in the last two weeks on the prophetic calendar is Jesus coming back and rapturing his church. God's going to save his church from judgment because believers will not get judged. Non-believers will be judged. Jesus already was judged for believer sins. The price for our sins has already been paid for. In Luke 17, 34 and 35, it says, That night, two people will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. The other left. Two women will be grinding flour together at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. There's going to look to be two results when Jesus comes back. People that are taken with the Lord forever and those who are left. Now, who's going to be left? Non-believers. Those that never made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of their lives and receive the free gift of forgiveness. Now, we're not going over this so you would go through the tribulation. We're going through this so you'd be saved from the great tribulation. That's love. So why a tribulation period? That's the big question. Number one, to bring time to an end. The end of the world is coming and it's coming soon. In 1 Pretty 4, 7, 4, 7, it says this, the end of the world is coming soon. When is the end of the world coming? It's the end of the world as we know it. Therefore, be earnest or sincere. Keep your conviction and discipline. Pursuing what is right despite temptations. In your prayers, stay in communication with God. What he's saying since you know this time is coming, stay focused. Don't let a temptation take you away from God and start living for the temporary and not be prepared for the eternal. Now, there will be temptation. And, and the Bible says in the last days, men will invent new ways to do evil. And we're inventing all kinds of new ways to do evil. We're becoming really imaginative when it comes to evil stuff. And we're pursuing it. And we're selling it. And we're seeing it. And the more you look at it, the more you want to do it yourself. I'm just inquisitive. I want to find out what's on the other side. It's the same exact thing that Satan did with Eve. He began to talk to her. He began to give her a talk. And uh, maybe you're missing out on something. You cannot continue to look at evil, expose yourself to temptation without building a desire for it. It's just a marketing campaign. So be careful how you live. A time as we know it is running out. We are moving towards a new reality. A time, a, a reality where time doesn't exist. We are moving towards the dimension of eternity. Now, when we go into eternity, there are no clocks. There are no watches. There are no days. There are no years. There are no minutes. It's eternity. And that's why the Bible says a year, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. There is no time. We're going to be living in eternity. And you'll be living in eternity on the right side or you'll be living in eternity on the right, wrong side because you're an eternal being. Be careful that you don't sell your soul. I mean, gain everything this world has to offer and you're not prepared for eternal life. It's coming. In Romans 13, 11, it says, this is all, this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running Wake up. Realize the time that you're living in. Understand you're living in the last days. The signs of the last days are here. Wake up for us. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. It's true. We're getting closer. Our lifestyle should reflect the fact that Jesus is coming soon and a great tribulation will follow. 
Romans 13, 12 says this, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on shining armor of right living. Make up your mind, get rid of the dirty deeds and start making up your mind. I'm gonna start living right. I'm gonna start living right for God. I'm gonna start living right for my family. I'm gonna start living right for my kids. It takes a real man and a real woman to make a decision. I'm gonna start living right. I'm gonna start talking right. Because, why should he start living right? Because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Understand, people are looking at your life. Don't live a dirty, secret life. We as believers, our, our lives should be able to be an open book where everybody could read. You don't have, come on, you don't have a secret life that should be different than your public life. Your public life and your secret life should be decent. Is that right? So he says, don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. See, either, either you're thinking about indulging your evil desires or you're thinking about pleasing God. And after service, some of you have the wrong aim. You're aiming towards sexual morality. You're aiming towards getting high. You're aiming towards getting drunk. You're aiming towards another wild party, another wild week. And God is saying, stop living like that. That kind of lifestyle will make sure you're not prepared when Jesus Christ comes back. The second reason we talk about the why a tribulation period, is to shake man from his false sense of security. A stable world leads men and women to think that they can function independently of God. Earthquakes, plagues, economic collapse, and famine will shake man's natural confidence, and hopefully it will lead to a realization that they need God. I remember... 9-11, when those planes hit the Trade Center, I remember what I was doing. I was preparing to go to work that morning. I could not believe that this was happening. It began to shake our nation. We seen presidents leading prayer. People started coming back to church because all the security that they thought they had, they no longer had. The coronavirus that just hit, who would have ever thought that the coronavirus would have had power to shut down our economy, shut down our schools, shut down churches? Millions of people died. What happened? It was just a shaking of our security. And anything that you've seen in the past, you haven't seen nothing yet. These are just birth pains. Terrorism, you haven't seen the worst terrorism yet. You have not seen the worst catastrophes yet. You have not seen the worst plagues yet. They're coming in the Great Tribulation. The rapture is the beginning of a completely destabilized world where there will be no sense of security. People are going to see a world without God and many of his blessings that keep this world safe and together and secure. It's all going to fall apart. People's money, power, or intelligence will not be able to save them from this tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, look what it says. It says, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly. You know what that means? It could happen any time. I don't expect Jesus to come now. Well, he's going to come unexpectedly. It's not when you, when, you, when you think it's going to happen. No one ever thought that coronavirus was going to happen. No one ever thought that the trade, cent the, the trade centers were going to fall. No one thought, but that's the way it's going to be. Like a thief in the night, 
when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. So those that are left behind, there'll be no escaping the great tribulation. The third reason for the great tribulation is this, is to give people one last chance to be saved. The choice at that time will never be as obvious as in the tribulation. It's going to be really basic. Serve the Antichrist Satan or serve Jesus and be saved. Everyone in the tribulation will be given a clear choice. Serve Satan or Jesus. Satan will say, serve me and I will let you buy and sell by taking my mark, 666. Or serve Jesus and be tortured and die. You choose. You want to eat? Take the mark. You want to buy and sell for your business? Take the mark. You want to feel safe? Take the mark. In Revelation 13, 16, it says, he required everyone, small and great, required rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without the mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let, every, let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, once someone takes the mark of the beast, their fate is settled for eternity. Taking the mark of the beast is the same thing as literally selling your soul to the devil. There'll be no coming back from that. There was a conversation that I heard with Joe Rogan and Elon Musk, and they were talking about the technology that they have right now to put a chip in your brain and basically download Google, the whole internet, AI in your brain. So they have that technology now. So what's gonna happen, just think about this, when they download that chip, also there's gonna be a mindset or a spirit that's downloaded, and it's gonna be the spirit of the devil. The people will start thinking like the devil, walking like the devil. Mom is gonna turn against her own kids and say, my kid didn't take the mark, arrest them, torture them. There will be a clear decision of who you're serving, but there'll also be a download of a demonic entity or a demonic mindset that you'll get immediately as well. You'll never, ever want to be saved. You'll be fighting against God, and that'll be your fate. Let's take a look at this video with Joe Rogan and Elon Musk about this chip and what are the benefits of it. It's like a miracle chip. Take a look at it. If someone does get a Neuralink installed, what will take place? What exactly is it? It would be implanted in your skull. So you basically take out a chunk of skull, put the Neuralink device in there. You'd insert the electrode threads very carefully into the, the brain. It can interface basically anywhere. So it could be something that uh, you know, helps cure, say, uh, eyesight. It returns your eyesight, even if you've like, lost your optic nerve type of thing. Uh, could really? Be, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hearing. Obviously, um, it, it could, in principle, fix almost anything that is wrong with the brain. Restore limb functionality, restores somebody who is a quadriplegic to full functionality. Like they can walk around. Whoa. Yeah. So. Maybe it, slightly better. Slightly better? Uh, over time, yes. You mean with future iterations? So just think about this. Not only the chip will allow you to buy and sell, but what if it could heal your hearing? make you walk again, give you sight? What if it could fix the depression that you have and not only give you happy thoughts? There's going to be some benefits. Understand, we are selling ourselves to wrong ideas all the time, and there's hardly anything like this at stake. Some of us are selling ourselves to temptation and sin and evil for just a good time. There is no negotiation. So gotta be careful. Because if you think I'll never take the mark, you're saying that now.
But if you were in a world that you couldn't eat and you would now be on the wrong side of society, already there's Christians selling out because they're cowards. They don't even want to stand up for what's right in the last days. What makes you think you're going to stand up for God if you can't even stand up to society today? So God's going to give one last chance for people to get saved. So now, let's talk about this. God's going to send angels to tell the whole world about Jesus in this time and what he did to save them. We won't be here to preach, so God will have to send angels. If we were here, we would be the representatives. But we're not going to be here. We're going to be raptured out because judgment is not for the believers. He saves his people from wrath. His people don't go through wrath. But still, God wants to reach the world. So what he's going to do, he's going to give them miraculous signs and wonders. And angels are going to start speaking throughout the whole world, telling them about Jesus. So no one living at that time will have an excuse. Look what it says. In Revelations 14, 6, and I saw another angel flying through the sky. Imagine this. This is going to be a time where the spiritual realm and the physical realm are now going to interact in this physical realm. You're going to actually see angels. But also in this time, as we go later in this talk, we're going to talk about also seeing demons. They're going to walk physically on this earth and carry out the plan they've always wanted to do and ki to kill, steal, and destroy. But let's take a look at this. And I saw another angel flying through the sky, sky, carrying the eternal good news about Jesus to proclaim to all people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people, everyone's going to hear. And this is what the angel's going to say, fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him. Give him credit. For the time has come when he will sit as a judge, judgment is coming. What you're going through is the beginning of judgment, but there's a final judgment coming. Worship him, the angel will say, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water, the creator of the universe. It's him. Worship him. Then another angel followed him through the sky. Another angel following. Babylon has fallen. The great city has fallen because she made... All the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Right now, the spirit of Babylon has been introduced to our world, especially America. And we're drinking the cup of her deception and we're drinking the cup of her passionate immorality. We're not only immoral today, we are passionately immoral. We're not just immoral, we're lewd in our behavior. That means if you don't like my behavior, forget you. I'm going to live the life I want to live and understand we're not just immoral, we're lewd. And lewd means that you're immoral with pride. Instead of hiding it, you're coming out. And saying, I am this. This is how I live. And if you don't like it, you're a bigot. And understand this. God is not trying to hurt you. This is what God's trying to do. He's trying to save us. But there's a spirit that's trying to capture your soul. And he's trying to capture your soul by passionate immorality. I mean, understand that. Porn's addicting. Adultery. Sex out of marriage, whatever perversion you're involved with, you can continue giving yourself to that. But understand, it's a spirit of Babylon. The third angel will follow and say, shouting, anyone who worships the beast and his statue or accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. And he starts saying, please don't take the mark because if you take the mark, the lake of fire will be in your future. But thank God many will be saved during the great tribulation. But they'll have to endure massive suffering, persecution and death. 
for their faith. And Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I saw a vast crowd too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne before the Lamb, before Jesus. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. Verse 13, Then one of the 24 elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they, where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one... Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of Jesus, the lamb, and God has forgiven them and made them white as snow. They aren't guilty. They've been saved. So now, let's talk about some of the terrible things that will happen during the, say, the seven-year tribulation. Now, is two categories that I'm going to cover today of what's going to happen. The first category, we're going to see a world that's completely destabilized, a completely destabilized world with the greatest natural disasters ever. The second category that we'll get into, hell will invade earth with demonic monsters and beasts and fallen angels. There'll actually be an invasion. Hell will be opened up and there'll be invasions of demons that you've never seen. Maybe you've seen them in your dreams, but you've never seen them in a physical world. And they're going to be saved for this time of judgment and they'll finally be released. But let's go back. First category, completely destabilized world with the greatest natural disasters ever. Their whole earth will go into convulsions. The appearance of the sun and the moon will be changed. Resulted in an atmosphere of pollution, darkness to cover the land, and make the moon to appear red. This is what's going to happen. A, an earthquake is going to happen so big that every island disappears and all the mountains leveled. We've experienced huge earthquakes even this year. And we're going to see more of them, and they're going to be more and more intense. But it's nothing compared to this one earthquake in the Great Tribulation. Look at Revelation 16, 17 that describes the earthquake. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a mighty shout came from the throne in the, in the temple saying, it is finished. Look what it says. Then the thunder crashed and rolled and lightning flashed and a great earthquake struck. The worst since people were placed on the earth. Verse 20. And every island disappeared, and all the mountains were leveled. In December 6, 2004, which wasn't so long ago, there was a 9.0 earthquake in the Indian Ocean. It packed the energy of a thousand atomic bombs. It caused a tsunami with waves 30 feet high, traveling at 500 miles per hour. This wave struck 10 nations, killed over 200,000 people, and injured over half a million, and left millions homeless. Islands were moved from the original locations. One report said of an island, Sumatra, which has 30 million people living in it, and has mountains of, that are as high as 12,000 feet, that, uh, that the island moved 100 feet southwest. This just happened so long ago. But God, it's like an alarm clock that's going off. He says, you haven't seen anything yet. Even in California, there's a lot of talk about earthquakes because of the great faults that are here. But understand, these earthquakes will happen. And those faults, those faults, if you're living on a fault line, understand it's really going to happen and the worst earthquakes in the world haven't happened yet, but they're going to be so bad that islands will be completely eliminated and mountains leveled. Let's take a look at what happened in 2004 with a 9.0, not the biggest earthquake, and how the water began to cover the islands. And after this earthquake, the earth will never be the same again. Take a look at it. That's a scene from the movie 2000, 2012, but it kind of gives an idea of the kind of waves that will happen during this kind of 
earthquake. We watched the news and bang, uh, there it was. From the quake's epicenter, the tsunami raced outward at more than 500 miles an hour. I volunteered to go to Thailand. Within 30 hours or so, I was already on the ground. Got the alert on my phone and I was checking and um, seeing that they needed people to deploy. So I got on a plane to Sri Lanka. Basically spent six weeks with hand baggage going around all the countries of the tsunami. There were a lot of affected victims that need help very quickly. They need food, they need shelter, medical help. There were islands which were completely submerged with the tsunami as the wave went over it. People hung on to those who survived, to palm trees and things, and then the wave came back. So for the second time they were submerged. What I did was simply ask what we could do, how we could help them. The way they responded was, we just need help in identifying the dead bodies. And there were six or seven of these disaster victim identification teams which came from Europe. And if you've seen a body after it's been in the sea for three days, it's black and you can't make out whether it's a male or a female, a Caucasian or Asian, and the whole place smelled to high heaven. I had never witnessed anything so horrifying in my life. Now these things are not something we're talking about that doesn't exist. This is just, as we're seeing them, God is letting us know, I'm giving you reference points. This can happen, and it's happening. But in the Great Tribulation, understand the book of Revelation is a revelation that comes from Jesus himself. So Jesus now is saying, understand, it's happened, but what's ready to happen is something you've never seen at the level you're going to see it. There'll be hailstorms with stones weighing as much as 75 pounds. In Revelation 16, 21, there was a terrible hailstorm and hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below. They cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. How committed were they, were they to their sin? They knew it was a judgment of God and God was giving them an opportunity to repent of their sins. But instead of repenting of their sins, what are they doing? Cursing God. The people are so determined to live in their sin, they don't repent and they don't get saved. They've chosen which side they're on, even after suffering through seven years of tribulation, where everything they believed in, leaned on, was, was destroyed, but they still choose to blaspheme God. And this is a problem. The more we reject Jesus, the more hard, the harder it will be and the more callous our heart will become. Redress, rejecting Christ today makes it easier for you to reject him tomorrow. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, including the stars. Meteor showers like we have never seen in the history of the world. The world will know that this is the result of the wrath of God on sin and all ungodliness, but they will still call on Mother Nature to save them, not Jesus. Be careful that you're not an advocate to the point that you're a greater advocate for Mother Nature and nature than you are for God. I'm not saying that we don't want clean air. I, what I'm saying is this, be careful that your cause is too small. Look what it says. In Revelation 6, 13, the, then the stars in the sky fell on the earth like green figs fallen from a tree shaken by the wind. God's holding everything together. He just starts taking one finger off and look what starts happening. The sky was rolled up like a scroll and, in, and all the mountains and islands were moved from their places and they cried. The people cried to the mountains and the rocks. Who did they cry out to? They didn't cry out to God. Fall on us. Hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They actually knew that it was a consequence for sins. And instead of admitting their sin and repenting of their sins and being saved, they began to be angry with God. 
another thing's going to happen. All water will be turned to blood. Massive thirst will hit the world. No water to drink or bathe in or refresh oneself. No more days at the beach, river, or lake. No more fishing or fish. Life as we know it is gone. And Revelation 16, 3 says this, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse. That means the, the blood will be like jelly. And everything in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs, and they became blood. And I heard the angel who had authority over the water saying, You are just, O holy one, who is and always was, because you have sent these judgments. This is actually grace, because everybody that's living in this time can actually be saved. They don't have to experience, they don't have to experience the eternal separation from God in a lake of fire. They can be saved. And God is saying, who you're serving is leading to destruction. Can't you see the destruction? And some of us are kind of in that place right now. You've been serving the devil, doing it your way, and you're depressed, and you're addicted, and everything's miserable, and you're still holding on. And God is saying, I'm not against you. I want to save you. I'm just showing you that right now, if you call on me, I'll forgive you. I'll save you. I'll set you free. I'll give you a new life. We even talked about two weeks ago, wild animals will turn on mankind and kill them. Let's talk about the second category. Hell will invade earth with demonic monsters and fallen angels. Some of the most powerful demons have been withheld and arrested in hell, but will be released during the Great Tribulation. They will be finally be, they'll finally be free to do what they've always wanted to do. The physical and spiritual world will now be one. People will finally see what demons look like and how evil they really are. And God's going to show them, these are the ones you're choosing to worship. I remember, and I've talked to you about this, that I went to Las Vegas a few years back. And when I went to Las Vegas, there was a demon and I saw it that visited my room. And I'm not one of those guys that always sees demons. I, I saw this one. And God showed me the demon. It was a real muscular demon, full of muscle. But yet, it had parts of a woman on him and a man. It had, it was like a gangster demon that was trans. I mean, that's what it was. And, and it attacked me, and it said this. When it attacked me, it says, what are you doing here? So somehow that demon knew that I crossed the borders of Las Vegas and he was saying, what are you doing here? Basically, you don't belong here. We got this city on lockdown and we don't need your kind coming in here. Of course, I rebuked that demon and it left. All I'm saying, I saw a picture of a demon. And but in those days, you're going to see them with your own physical eyes and they're going to carry out all their destruction. Let's take a look at this first beast. It's going to be an army of demonic locusts with scorpion-like tails. And they'll be released from the bottomless pit and be given the power to sting and torture for five months. I know it's hard to kind of imagine this, but you've seen enough movies to kind of imagine it. And where are they getting all these ideas of dragons and beasts? We've seen them. And this is where they're getting ideas from. They're getting pictures of the spiritual realm. But imagine being in a world where these beasts, these monsters, these demonic beasts are on earth torturing. Look what it says. In Revelation 9, 1 through 12, it says, Then the fifth angel blew the trum his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky. The star is Satan. He was in heaven, he fell to the earth. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So there's actually a key to this bottomless pit. I've cast out demons and I've told them to go to the pit and I've had demons beg me, don't send me there. It's a real place where demons are there being arrested, but there's gonna be a time in the great tribulations where they're gonna be released. 
When he opened it, saying, open the bottomless pit, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and the air turned dark from the smoke. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people. In verse 5, they were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will, will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth, and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of, a, of iron. Their wings ro roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions. And for five months, they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abad Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer, the first terror is past. But look, two more terrors are coming. What he's saying is this is bad, but something's still coming. Imagine being in a world where demons are literally physically attacking you. You can't die. The pain's going to be so massive that people are going to want to die, but they're going to have to go through the suffering. Let's take a look at some other demons, fallen angels that are invade the earth. Four fallen angels or demons will be released to kill one third of the world with an army of 200 million demonic troops. With, and they're going to be dragon-like horses. How many movies about dragons, dungeons and dragons? And all dragons, what they have is fire coming out of their mouth. The reality is, I don't know if, is, is, are dragons something that's, it's a fairy tale or is it real? Well, the idea here is we're going to see that they're actually real. They're just demons. But they're going to hit the earth. Look at what it says here. In Revelation 9, 14, and the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels, release these four demons who are bound at the great Euphrates. We know they're demons because they're bound. Then the four angels or the four fallen angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on earth. These angels powerful angels are now in hell and they're wondering when am I going to be released to kill and destroy I can't wait and they're going to do what they've always wanted to do it's going to be ferocious then the four angels had been prepared for this hour verse 16 I heard the size of their army which was 200 mounted troops in, and in my vision I saw the horses and riders sitting on them the riders wore armor that was fiery, red, and dark, blue, yellow. The horses had heads like lions. And fire and smoke and burning sulfur, sulfur, sulfur billowed from their mouths. Check this out. The, the, the locusts come in with the scorpions. And just when you think it's over, these 200 mounted horses come. The horses, lions, one-third, verse 18, of all the people on earth were killed by these plagues, by the fire and the smoke, burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. Now, understand this. This is a picture of what Jesus is showing us is going to happen. How scary 
that some people in this room, because they refuse to believe that one day this will be their reality. And there'll be no way to escape it. The time for salvation is now. Just like when God was talking through Noah and telling him rain is coming, judgment is coming. Mankind has a way of ignoring the warnings. Because we're so captured by the present that we don't think about our future. And God is saying, be careful that you don't gain the whole world and so busy with this life that you're not prepared for your eternal life and that Jesus comes back soon and he comes back and you're unprepared and there'll be no escape. You'll have to live through this. But God loves you enough to warn you. This is not for you. Let's take a look at this clip. And this is a clip of a movie trailer, the book, the movie name Remaining, but it kind of begins to show us a little picture of some of the things that I've talked to you about today. Take a look at it. You have any idea what's going on out there? We'll find out soon enough. My name's Tommy Covington. If you are watching this, then I'm probably dead. People. The rapture. Reports are coming in from Lagos to Cape Town. It's happening everywhere. Revelations 9. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. And opened the abyss. What was that sound? Something's in the tree. That's out there. What is that? What is this thing? One of the fallen. than that that's just a picture and we're living in a time think about it that we could actually show to you videos of what it might be like because we're in the last days so God's doing everything he can to communicate the future to us so we can actually see some of it on film today this is the first time in history that we could actually see some of these things portrayed so we can actually see them, so we could get a clearer message. The message cannot be clearer than it is today. And how do we respond? What should, we, what should, be, what should be our response about these terrible prophecies about the Great Tribulation? This is it. Call on Jesus to save us and forgive us of our sin before it's too late. That's it. This is a great message. A lot of churches don't want to talk about this stuff because they don't want to scare people. But understand this, that's not very loving, not talking about a certain future. I love you and I want to see you in, and I want to see you in church. I want to see you live. I want to see you live an abundant life. I want to see you overcome your addiction. I want to see you joyful. I want to see you prosper. Uh, but most of all, I want to see you in heaven. Come on, for eternity. I don't want to see you suffering or being left behind. Look what it says here. Isaiah 55, 6, and it says this. So you should look for the Lord before it's too late. You should call on him now while he is near. Evil people should stop living evil lives. They should stop thinking bad thoughts. They should come to the Lord again 
and he will comfort them. They should come to our God because he will freely forgive them. Is that awesome? That God said, if you come to me, I'll comfort you, I'll heal you, I'll save you, I'll forgive you, I'll save you from judgment, I'll set you free from your addiction. Come on, I'll give you a new life and I'll forgive you of everything you've ever done. This is a message, I'll forgive you so you do not have to experience the judgment that's coming. The good news, all that call on Jesus will be saved. Saved from the judgment of sin, the great tribulation, and eternal separation from God in the lake of fire, which is the second death and the final judgment. In Romans 10, 13, in this last verse, it says, for everyone, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, invoking his name as Lord, will be saved. He said, you just call on me, I'll, say, I'll, I'll save you. Be careful that you don't have more faith in Alexia than God. Alexia, turn on the jazz station, and she responds, jazz station. And God is saying, Alexia answers you. I'll always answer you. You just call on me. He says, I've been waiting. Come on, call on Jesus, and he'll save you. That means he's going to deliver you from the penalties of the judgment of sin, from the power of sin. He'll rescue, rescue you from danger and destruction. He's going to make you well. He's going to heal you. He's going to restore your health. He's going to give you, come on, he's going to make you whole. He's going to give you a new life. Come on. God wants to give you the life you've been looking for. <laughs> Salvation. Wow. This place is full. I don't think we have any more seats available. Probably have overflow today. But there's a lot of people that come to this church and they've given their lives to Jesus. And because they're giving their lives to Jesus, they are no longer the same person. They did not join a religion. They entered in a relationship with the creator of the universe that made them whole, saved them, restored them, got them back on track, and they have eternal life. Today's your day. Call on him while you can, because once you die, it's too late. And if you get left behind, you must go through the great tribulation. Seven years of nonstop suffering. And the only way you're going to be saved through the tribulation is dying. Being tortured, going hungry, experiencing all these things. And Jesus is saying, why do you want to be in that group when I die, to set you free from that. Now understand, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But understand this, if you don't call on the name of the Lord to save you, you won't. You could be drowning, but if you don't ask God to save you or rescue you, you drown. Judgment has already been said. Every person in here without Christ, you've already been sentenced. Death. Judgment. But what Jesus did, he took your sentence. You did the crime. He died and suffered for the wrong we've done. He paid the price. The price must be paid, but God sent his son to pay the price. His innocent son, the innocent for the guilty so we could be forgiven. The price must be paid. It's law, but he paid it so we could go free so we could be forgiven, so we could have eternal life. And I'm telling you, I'm not just living forever out there in eternity with this place with no pain, no suffering, no death, no devil, but I'm going to start living a good life right now. Come on, come on, where I can have joy, I can have peace, I can fulfill purpose, I can be victorious. It's your choice. Now, three persons in this room, make it simple. You heard this, and you know this. If Jesus were to come back right now, you're saying, I don't know if I'm, I'll be saved. I, I think I might be left behind, or I'm not sure I'll go. Now, don't play with your future, and don't let your pride get in the way either. What I mean by that is, is be careful that you're so concerned about what people think that you never give your life to Jesus. What are people going to think? You know what people are going to think? They're going to congratulate you. It takes a real man and a woman and say, man, I messed up. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Jesus saved me. It's going to be congratulations. So you're not sure. Number two, 
is that you're a Christian, but you haven't been living like one. You've been doing your thing and you're realizing, man, I, I should be living like time's running out and I'm living like it's 1999 and I'm partying. I'm getting drunk, I'm getting high, I think I'm a player, I, I just, I'm just sleeping wherever I, I, whoever wants to sleep with me, I just can't wait to get out of here, man, I'm gonna do my thing. And, and, and you're living a fake life, I'm telling you, you know that you're empty and you need to be saved. But I got good news for you. You don't fix your life and come to Jesus. You come with your addiction. You come with your bad thoughts. You come, you come with your struggle. We all struggle. We all, met, we all need help. He'll forgive you. That's it. And he'll change you. So we're not, God's not saying, hey, change your life, come to me. God says, come to me and I'll change your life. You don't fix it and come to Jesus. Come to me and I'll fix it. So we bring him our broken pieces. He puts it back together. So you're, you're a Christian, but you backslid. It's time to come back home. Live your life like you know Jesus Christ is coming back and there's a tribulation in the future. And number three, you're in this room. You've never given your life to Jesus. You know, man, I know I'm off track and I know I'm a sinner and I want Jesus to forgive me and save me and give me the gift of eternal life. And whoever calls, salvation is a gift. Say it with me, salvation is a? It's not a reward. I was at, I was at, at Ontario Mills Thursday or Friday and there was a young lady that came up to me she doesn't know much English she's Romanian and she came up to me because she was hungry and she wanted lunch so I go I'm gonna give you I'm gonna buy your lunch no doubt about it I go but before I buy you lunch do you know if today were your last day on earth that you'd go to heaven you'd be saved she goes I don't understand English I go, okay, let's get a translator. So we got a Google translator. <laughs> I care about her, so I'm not going to get a little translation. Right now we got all this stuff. Let's just use it. Right? So I just started talking, turning about Jesus. She goes, oh, I understand now. Oh, I understand now. Oh, I understand. I go, you want to receive Jesus as your Savior? She goes, yes. Now understand this. She had to say yes. If she doesn't say yes, she's not saved. You're not going to get to heaven by accident. There's going to be no surprises. No one here is going to get to heaven and realize, oh, I never knew. <laughs> Surprise, you made it. <laughs> You're going to be there because heaven is not for, come on, perfect people. It's for forgiven sinners. Someone had to admit, I'm a sinner. Save me, Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to count to three. I love you, and I know I went just a little over, but understand, I just went through the whole book of Revelations for you. I just did a miracle right there. I'm going to count to three. If you're saying, Pastor, that's me, I'm not sure about Jesus would come back, I'm saved, or I'm a backslider. It's time for me to come back home and start living like there's an eternity to live for. Or number three, I know I need salvation. I'm not saved. I want Jesus to come into my life and give me a new life and save me. And I'm telling you, he'll forgive you, he'll save you, and he'll give you the power to live a new life. His spirit will come inside of you and make you a new person. You're thinking, I can't do it. And, God, and I'm going to tell you, true, you can't do it, but God can do it in you. Come on, let God in. He's knocking your heart's door. You got to let him in. One, when I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over the building. I want to be saved. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I want to be forgiven. I want to be ready if Jesus were to come back. One, raise your hand if that's you. I'm not sure. I want to recommit my life. This is my moment. Raise your I'm not asking you to buy your heads, close your eyes, but I've learned this. If you're ashamed of God here, you'll never live for God out there. And understand this, you weren't ashamed of your sin. You are flaunting. It's time to make up your mind. I'm going to serve God, and I don't care who knows it. I'm proud of this decision. It takes a real man and woman to live for God. One. When I say three, quickly raise your hand. Two. Three. Raise your hands all over this building and say, that's me. Proud of you, baby. Proud of you, young man. Come on, proud of you, proud of you, proud of you. Come on, anybody else? Come on, I see you there. Come on, it takes a real man, a woman to do this. Anybody else? Way in the back over there. I see that. Keep your hands up. Come on, keep your hands up. See that, those hands right there, those young men right there. Anybody else? I want those. I see you. I see you. I see you. Okay, I want those to raise their hands. I want you to do one more thing. I want you to stand up right where you're at. Come on, let everybody know. I made a decision. I'm standing up for God. Come on, it takes a real man, a woman. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're standing up. Everybody stand with them now. Let's stand with them. Let's join them. No one leave yet. I'm going to dismiss it just a second. I don't want them to, they're, they're trying to, they're going to be coming up here 
and you don't want to stop the traffic from them coming up here. So this is what I want you to do. Those that raised their hands and stood up, I want you to do me a big, big, big favor. Will you give me the honor and privilege of praying with you? I want to pray with you a prayer to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Why I'm asking you to come there? Because faith without action is it produces no results. There has to be a day that you walk away from your old life and walk to your new life. Come on. Those that raise their hands or stood up, why, I want you to come up here real quick. We're just going to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're not going to do an interview. We're just going to pray. Come on. Let's give them a hand. Ask your neighbor. If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. There's somebody that you're still sitting there and you didn't stand up, but you could come up here right now. Right now is your time to stand. Right now is your time to walk. Come on, let's give them a hand, church. Someone is determined in their eternal life. No one could be saved. Come on, after, come on, no one could be saved after death. No one could be saved after the tribulation. This is our time. Online, give your life to Jesus. Stand up right where you're at. Stop your car. Let's pray. Come on, they're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on, they're still coming. Let's welcome them into the kingdom of heaven. Proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of you. God bless you. It takes a real man to do this. Proud of you. Proud of you, okay? New day. New day. God, we're getting ready. Get ready for forgiveness. This is tonight, today. This is your moment, okay? And I'm going to tell you this. Receive forgiveness. Because if you don't receive forgiveness and you don't forgive yourself, you will not allow yourself to move forward because you'll be under a guilt trip. You don't need to be under a guilt trip. Jesus paid the price for everything you've done wrong. It's time for you to be forgiven. Receive a new identity. Come on, new beginning. Okay? I'll tell you what, God loves you, we love you. Now we're going to say a prayer. And the Bible, say, Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. He's ready to come in with the Spirit. He wants a relationship with you. Now and forever. So what's coming into your heart? Love. God's love. And love is powerful. Love is the most powerful weapon on earth. <laughs> Could conquer anything. Let's go ahead and give our lives to Jesus. And after we say this prayer, we're going to pray with you, but after we say this prayer, I'm going to talk about a book I want to give you that I wrote to help you on your first 15 days. So we're going to map out your first 15 days living for God. And we're going to talk about starting at the way, starting with your way with the Lord. Are you ready to follow Jesus? Come on, we're going to help you, but you're ready to follow Jesus. Okay, it's going to take some work. You're going to be saved right now, but then we're going to follow. It's going to take some investment. Okay, let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner that deserves judgment. But I believe that you love me so much that you died on the cross and you suffered for all my sins so that I could be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. Today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent, turn away from all my sin. I'm done with my evil ways. I'm done living for the devil. I'm living for you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me, saving me, and giving me the free gift of eternal life. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new person. Today, I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. You didn't join a religion. You gave your life to Jesus. Let's give him a hand, church. God bless you. Um, get, your, your, get your tickets. There's only like 200 tickets left for Friday. Um, you just have to get a lead night ticket in the foyer. Get your tickets. Only a few left. You want to make sure you get one. They're going to be all gobbled up today. So this is going to be the last day we're offering it. And then Friday, we're going to have the movie Wednesday night, Overcoming Series. We're going to be talking about overcoming depression. That's going to be Wednesday night. You do not want to miss it. God bless you. We love you. Everyone here, let's, let's pray. And then we'll introduce you to the book.